All right, thank you, Liz. Um, so welcome everybody that uh, that's joining us so far and uh, anybody else that pops on coming up. Uh, just a, a couple of quick things uh, with the uh, questions. If you have any questions, please feel free to type those into the chat box. Uh, if it's a question that maybe needs to be answered right away while I'm going through some slides, uh, I can answer those at that point. If you, uh, if it can wait, I'll just let it wait till the end. Uh, there'll be a question and question and answer at the end. If you want to answer, ask a more specific question and unmute your microphone, you can. Um, that's no problem. So, without further ado, uh, let's just get started. I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. So this, uh, this class is uh, Saving Energy in Your Home. It's the COVID-19 edition, as many things are lately. Um, my name is Brendan Shoemaker. I'm a residential energy assessor. Uh, I work for Project Home, and I've been with Project Home since 2008. Uh, during that time, I've become a certified uh, BPI building analyst. Uh, I'm also a DOE, that's Department of Energy, uh, Home Energy Score, uh, scorer. I think is the actual term for it, which isn't a great term, but uh, I digress. So uh, I'm also a uh, lead safe renovator and I'm also a certified asbestos inspector for the state of Wisconsin. So if you have any questions about any of those things, I can certainly answer those as well. Um, so as I stated, who I am, uh, since two th I've been here since 2008 and over that time, I've uh, done assessments or worked on uh, over a thousand buildings. So I certainly have a, a good grasp on uh, the different types of buildings that we, uh, we deal with uh, on a daily basis here in the state of Wisconsin, uh, mainly in Dane and Green counties. Uh, a little bit further information for you. I'm also the uh, head, head Muay Thai kickboxing instructor at Fight Prime Training Center. I've been, uh, I've been involved in martial arts pretty much my whole life. But uh, these are some really old photos. <laughs> I look very young. And uh, just a little, uh, little extra something for you to, uh, uh, to know about me. Uh, since this is COVID-19 edition, I figure it's a, a good idea to just be a little more open with, uh, with my background. So if you have any questions about any of that, I can answer that as well. Okay, so kind of going through here. Uh, some of these may look familiar to you. A lot of icicles, uh, snow on the roof, patchy areas of snow melt on the roof. Uh, those, all those things signal issues with your home. And the winter is a great time to find out that, uh, well, a good time and a bad time, to find out that you have uh, issues with your home. So these are some of the things that, uh, that we see a lot of in the, uh, the weatherization field. And if you see any of these on your home, this is, uh, this is typically an issue. If you're having to get out the roof rake to get rid of the snow melt so that it doesn't become icicles or ice dams, then uh, you, you certainly have some issues. And we'll go over some of those things today. Uh, this one probably looks familiar, especially if you use a lot of electricity in your home. Electricity every year is going up and up and up, uh, and uh, while well, natural gas tends to be staying the same. So if you're seeing higher and higher energy bills, this is a good time to think about what we can do to, uh, to bring that down. So I'm gonna go through some real boring stuff. I'm gonna kind of fly through this. Uh, you know, if you have any specific questions while I'm going through these, please try, type it into the chat box and questions. Uh, but this is kind of the building science portion to make sure that we're all on the same page before I go on. So. It is up to you on how much energy your home uses. And the most common types of energy for our area are natural gas, which is plentiful. Most people are on natural gas in the cities. Uh, propane is something that you would see for the more rural areas um, or just outside of town where they haven't uh, expanded their natural gas lines. Uh, fuel oil, we still see some fuel oil, uh, but it's, it's becoming less and less. Uh, fuel oil is just very expensive. It's very inefficient. It's it's smelly and uh, dirty as well. Uh, wood and pellets typically you would see this out in rural areas too. Um, we don't we don't see many 
uh, wood stoves used as, as a primary heating source anymore. And electricity, electric baseboards, typically something we would see with a, uh, uh, apartment buildings or multi-unit multi style buildings. So like I said, building science, the boring stuff. Um, so the building science, study of heat, air, and moisture flow within the buildings. And we're looking at a building not as a combination of its individual parts, but as a whole system. And the, a home works as a whole system. And if one piece of the home isn't working correctly, the rest of the house is not going to be working correctly either. So here's some, uh, some just kind of illustrations of the home as a system. When you're looking at these, uh, these diagrams, you can see how air is coming in at the bottom of the building and then the, the warm air is being let out to the top of the building. Uh, this is what we call a stack effect and I'll go over that more in a little bit. You can also see what on the picture on the right, that's a uh, infrared, uh, infrared photograph of a home. And you can see how the red areas, which are the areas of warm air, so that's the uh, uh, warm air hitting the roof deck and the side of the building there. So you know that there's an insulation issue, insulation and air sealing issue there uh, that we would want to contend with. There's three ways that heat, are tra heat is transferred. Number one is conduction. Uh, conduction, you can think of it as if you grab a, a hot pan on the stove, it doesn't burn for a second, but after a couple of seconds, you feel it because that heat's going right into your hand, it's going from warm to cold. Uh, convection is through, uh, through airflow, and radiation is generally through solar gain, but also from uh, some heating sources can create a radiative uh, heating source as well. So stack effect, I mentioned this previously. Stack effect, if you look at this as a, a one-story home, so the bottom is the basement, and then the living area is the, uh, the second part, or the, like the top story there. And then you've got your roof and your attic space. So in the winter, you're gonna have uh, cold air that comes in at the bottom of the building. So that's entering through uh, all the cracks, all the pipe penetrations through your home at the bottom of the house. And then as it goes up, it's like a chimney and we call that the stack effect. That warm air is gonna go up because warm air does rise. Uh, it's primarily through a pressure gradient, but as it rises, it's going to find all the spots on the, uh, on the top side of the building for it to actually flow out. So all that air that you just took all that time to warm up for, uh, for your home is now leaving the building through the top. And this is where we talk about ice damming. So ice damming is directly related to stack effect. Ice damming occurs when you have snow melt or snow that's built up on the roof and you've got warm air that comes up through the attic space, hits the roof deck, warms that roof deck to a point that you start to get trickles of water coming underneath the snowpack. And then when it gets to the soffit area, which is cold, there's a, there's a pretty much a, a zone where it goes from warm to cold. As soon as it hits that cold spot, it turns back into ice and that water will start to back itself up under your shingles. As it gets more and more under the shingles, then it starts to soak through the roof decking and then when the roof decking gets wet enough, it drops down into the attic. And as it gets through all of your insulation or whatever you have up there, it gets into the drywall. And then you start to see the staining around your edges of, edges of the home uh, on the second story or the top story of the house. As soon as you start seeing that staining that you know there's a, there's a water issue. Uh, so that needs to be taken care of right away. Uh, and that starts with making sure that uh, you don't have that warm air infiltration into the attic, which is going to be causing your, uh, uh, your ice damming issue. So after all of that, you're probably thinking, ah, the monster house, right? And this is certainly true for some, but the good news is we can tame that monster house and we're going to go over how. So where do we start? So I'm going to give you six projects that are going to identify the most common energy problems in your home and how to solve them, or at least the, uh, the tools to solve them. So 
project number one, air sealing. So this includes attic, basement, windows, doors, anywhere that you have any type of a, uh, um, a hole in the shell of the house. Insulation, attics, walls, basement box sills, which is the spot right above the foundation and the foundation itself. Electrical base loads, such as fridges, freezers, and all of your lighting, because yes, your lighting does have make a difference not only on your electrical bill, but on your heating and cooling load. Uh, HVAC, uh, HVAC stands for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, uh, or water heater modifications or replacements, things like pipe wrap, duct mastic, uh, sealing your duct work, uh, replacing full units. Ventilation. Efficient ventilation can increase the uh, indoor, indoor air quality and it decreases the chances of mold and other building design failures. And water saving measures, uh, low flow toilets, low flow shower heads, faucet restrictors, uh, anything to reduce the amount of water that you use in your home. And that includes all of those plumbing leaks that maybe you've uh, put off for the last few years because eh, it's only a little drip. Well, the little drip becomes a big drip uh, more often than not and that adds up to a big drip if you talk about it throughout a year. Okay, so first project is air sealing. Uh, air sealing the envelope is one of the most important things to help ensure the long longevity of the structure, but it's also one of the things that's gonna make the house feel the most comfortable. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've worked on homes where somebody's said, you know, after just the air sealing, before we've even done insulation, uh, just the air sealing measures, people will be like, it feels so much warmer here. It's just more comfortable. They don't have the drafts going through their homes. And, uh, and then as soon as we put the insulation on top of that, they're like, oh man, that made such a huge difference. So, you know, little things like caulking, you know, taking, taking some caulk, caulking around windows, anywhere that you may see um, uh, cracks around the, uh, uh, the foundation, around, around windows, around doors, uh, all those things are gonna be good for air sealing. Up in the attic, uh, you can see in these pictures, you know, we do a really good job of making sure that we foam any penetrations, especially on the, uh, the, the framing, all the way through the attic before we do any other insulation work. Uh, and then that last picture is above the, uh, the foundation, those are the box sills. So that's using a, um, a two-part foam to insulate that area, but it also air seals at the same time. So best practice for air sealing is start at the top, up in the attic, and work your way down to the basement. Um, you can do, use a lot of different types of air sealing materials, foam, uh, caulking, other stripping, uh, door jams and sweeps, what you would put around uh, exterior door. And then also even plastic for windows uh, uh, or metal for around the gaps around the chimney. You never want to put anything combustible next to a chimney, especially if it's a chimney that's in use, because it can get hot. So we always air seal with metal uh, to, to air seal that gap between the drywall and or the framing and the chimney. And then insulation, uh, but in order to have properly installed insulation, you have to air seal first. Anybody that tells you just put a whole bunch of insulation in your attic um, is, you know, to make it more comfortable is kind of giving you a line because you need the two things to work in conjunction together. It's, I always, uh, my big thing is I say, it's like a sweater and a windbreaker. You know, if it's a, if it's a cold day out there, cold, rainy, wet day, and kind of similar to today, and you're just wearing a windbreaker, yeah, you, the breaks, it cuts the wind down, but you still feel cold. But as soon as you put a sweater under that windbreaker and zip that windbreaker up, and then you feel the real benefits of having that air seal and the insulation. So it's the same with the house. So sweater and a, sweater and a uh, windbreaker. Um, I'm gonna patent that at some point or trademark that, so just be aware of that. Um, so different types of insulation that you can see here, uh, we've got, Spray foam on the, uh, the top left, which is extremely expensive to do, uh, very labor intensive and the material is expensive as well. But it's, if you want the best insulation, uh, that's it because it's about our six per square inch, which is very high. Uh, top right, you've got cellulose insulation being blown in. 
Cellulose is typically what we would use for uh, attic insulation or wall insulation. Um, it is uh, a very good type of insulation, has a very good uh, bang for the buck. It's less expensive than fiberglass and it has a higher R value. Um, R value is just resistance to heat transfer. So the higher the R value, the better uh, type of insulation it is. Bottom left, you've got the classic fiberglass bats. Um, you know, fiberglass you would use somewhere where there's potential that it could get wet. Uh, if, you know, especially against a foundation wall or something like that, because uh, fiberglass won't mold. And then also on the bottom right there, you've got your, uh, your insulated uh, foam sheathing. So, you know, it could be one inch or two inch type foam, usually put on the exterior of a home before they side it. Um, so, like I said, different types of insulation. You got blown in insulation, which you typically would use in the attic, uh, but also in the walls as well. In new construction, they generally use bat, uh, fiberglass bat insulation. Uh, I wish they would stop and use more cellulose, but that, uh, that happens, so. The box stills, the area uh, right above the foundation wall, uh, using foil-faced fiberglass bats uh, that you can staple into the joists, or spray foam is your best option here. But make sure, remember, that you have to do, make a picture frame with foam first so that you air seal that area first. Um, basement walls, rigid foam board is good for that. Uh, it's also good on the exterior, uh, the exterior side of the foundation. Uh, just have to dig it down at least 12 inches past the frost line. And roof decking, some people have, will actually do insulation in the roof decking and they'll use spray foam. Uh, that requires a fairly professional installation. It's pretty expensive but it does give you the option then to open up the attic for uh, storage, or if it's a, a story and a half style house, then you maybe could area, have an area for, um, for living space up there as well. Uh, pressure boundary and thermal boundary. So pressure boundary is your interior drywall or plaster, whatever you have on your walls or your ceiling, that's your pressure boundary. Your thermal boundary is your insulation, so you always want those lined up right next to each other. You don't want to have a gap between the insulation and the wall because all this air movement is just going to take away all of the insulation that you uh, that you have there. This can take away the effect of the insulation you have. Okay. So electrical base loads. So if you uh, if you have any fridges or freezers like this in your home, this is a good time to get rid of them. Um, these appliances, I can't tell you how expensive it is to keep, uh, you know, Uncle Lenny's old fridge in your garage uh, that's, you know, 75 years old and you just use it to throw a couple of, you know, six packs of beer in there or something. Um, nothing wrong with having a beer fridge, of course, but these are so expensive. I mean, you're talking about, uh, I, I'll, give you a, I'll just give you a, a quick example. A home that I did an assessment at within the last couple of weeks had a really old fridge, R12 refrigerant. I think it was about a 30 year old fridge. When I metered it, uh, taking into account how much he was paying for his electrical, uh, we figured out that it was gonna be close to $400 a year just to run that, that one machine. So, that's that's ridiculous um get rid of them you know replace it if you if you can um if it's something where you don't need it you know if it's something that you could do without um focus on energy offers free pickup and recycling of old appliances you can go to focus on energy.com and just go to the residential part and the appliance pickup and they can schedule a pickup of uh of old appliances like these um, if it's anything that's manufactured before 1993, uh, it's using three to five times more energy than a new model. Um, get rid of them. This is the time to do it. You will thank yourself uh, down the road when you're not spending $400 on an old fridge. Okay. So HVAC. So as I mentioned, HVAC is uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, um, and we'll also talk about water heater and modifications. So insulating the pipes on your water heaters or if you have a boiler, uh, you know, the boiler is the, the one that's on the, the far right here. Generally, most people have a forced air furnace in, in our area, 
but there are a lot of there are a few boilers um i run into them every once in a while and uh getting those hot uh, hot side pipes insulated the full the full basement if you can get to them do do the all all of it uh all of the hot side and at least six feet of the cold the cold pipe because you do have some heat loss into that area. So if you can kind of get that to recycle, that's good. Uh, but, you know, do all the hot side for sure. And if you have anything like a boiler that maybe has a sidearm uh, to a, um, a, a tank, a holding tank, uh, make sure that you insulate that loop that goes between those two. Uh, that's a big area of heat loss. Water heater blankets, um, I don't really suggest doing water heater blankets. They could be installed on an older unit, but if you've got a really old water heater, it's probably, you know, getting close to being the time to replace it where it's going to fail. Uh, so you could put a water heater blanket on an, on an older unit, but in, for the most part, the newer models of uh, water heaters have a ton of insulation, have a, a thick foam insulation on the inside, and all you're going to do is just run the risk of rusting the tank out and just getting it to, uh, to fail earlier than it should. Um, duct mastic. So this is sealing your, your, uh, the seams in your duct work. Um, getting a duct mastic, you can get that from Menards or Lowe's or Home Depot, wherever you go. Um, it comes in a generally like a gallon, a gallon jug and it looks like paste and it kind of is paste. Um, but you can put that on the seams and that will help to seal that up so that you're not just having the, you know, hot air leaking right out of your, uh, um, your supply ducts instead of going where it needs to be. So the HVAC system works as a pressurized system. So as soon as it kicks on, that blower motor kicks on, all of that ductwork pressurizes. So the higher the pressure you have in there, the more you lose through all those seams. So those seams, it'll keep it well pressurized and you'll get all that hot air going to, the, to those spots. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, well, my, you know, furnace is on this side of the house, my bedroom's on this side of the house. Uh, it always feels like it's way too cold over there, but it's way too hot on the other side. And you can probably fix that by just sealing those, uh, those seams. Uh, apply it with a brush or use like a mastic backed uh, tape, what we'd call like a butyl tape for bigger gaps, uh, especially close to the furnace. And if you have any crawl spaces, make sure that you seal the ductwork and insulate it if you've got uh, um, ductwork going through those cold crawl spaces. Uh, and, you know, it's something, these are all things that you can find. You can get tips and tricks on YouTube um, if you want to tackle it yourself, or you can always hire a, a, a contractor to do this as well. Um, if your furnace or water heater is old, you know, 20 plus years, that's about max life for most things now. Um, might be thinking about installing a new unit. So high efficiency furnace, 93 to 96% can save you a big chunk of money uh, over the, you know, the old 80 percenters, uh, the mid efficiencies as we call them. Uh, focus on energy rebates are plentiful. And as long as you work with a contractor that is able to get those rebates for you, they'll generally put those as a, uh, um, uh, like an instant rebate right off the top, so it's it's cutting your uh, uh, cutting your bill down, your invoice down right out right from right from the get go. Uh, lighting. So as I said, lighting is you know we're not ta just talking about the electricity cost um, by replacing you know old incandescent light bulbs or even CFL light bulbs, uh, which you know CFLs are kind of going going away too, or they've become uh, less likely to use because of uh, LEDs. LEDs are the wave of the future, at least for right now, until something, some new technology comes out. But uh, if you have old incandescent light bulbs, you know, the Edison light bulbs, if you grab them and they're hot, you know it's an Edison light bulb, uh, incandescent style, get rid of them because it's not only, deal, it's not only uh, creating issues with your electrical bill, but it also adds to the heating and cooling load of your home. So if you've got a whole bunch of incandescent light bulbs and you're trying to run your AC unit, there's a good chance that you know you're just having that warmth from those light bulbs can make uh, uh, the air conditioning have to work harder 
to get that. Um, I guess in the winter, no big deal, but we're talking more this summer, so that's part of the cooling mode. Uh, LEDs, LEDs come in every shape, every size. You can find them in warm light or daylight equivalent. Um, you know, red ones, if you want red ones, I don't know why, but uh, if you do, that's uh, uh, a good time to switch out those light bulbs. Okay, get rid of the incandescents, get the LEDs. Ventilation, so ventilation is really kind of like um, the thing that doesn't get discussed as much and it really needs to. Uh, indoor air quality is EPA, one of the EPA's top five environmental risks to people's public health. And it's generally, you know, we're talking about asthma, allergies, you know, dust mites, which are the little nasty things in the bottom left, uh, mold, mildew, all of those things, uh, you know, are, are a problem. You don't want those in the breathing zone. You don't want those in within the indoor, uh, the indoor part of your home. So if you've got ventilation that's very old, you know, the, the fan that maybe kicks on and it, and it sounds like a, um, it just kind of like growls as it's, ro as it's rolling, probably it's something that needs to be replaced. You know, you, you, we can get uh, somebody out to check the fan, you know, do a fan test, see if it's actually pulling enough exhaust air. It may not be. And uh, you want to have ventilation that's not only working correctly, but pulling, drawing enough air from the home and expelling it to the outside of the home. So as you can see on the bottom right here, okay, there's this, this venting is going directly onto the roof vent or onto the roof deck. And that's caused a, a mold issue there because you've got cold and warm, humid air hitting that side. So now you've created a mold issue there. Um, that's going to cause the roof to uh, fail early, and it's also going to um, potentially cause other health issues. So ventilation is something that gets overlooked, and if you, uh, if you can get new bath fans in there, ones that are stronger bath fans into all of your bathrooms and your, above your range, above your, um, your stove, make sure that's going out too. Uh, you want to have some kind of a range hood or some kind of fan uh, to, keep, to keep that uh, that warm, moist air from cooking from going to the outside. You don't want it to stay in your house. A uh, properly exhausting bath fan can help with indoor air quality issues, and it can also save energy and money and repair costs down the road. Um, be sure that a bath fan is a minimum of 80 CFM. Uh, CFM is cubic feet per minute of air exchange. Ventilation, it's hooked up properly in the attic to exhaust to the outdoors. Has to go to the outdoors, that's a code. Um, it's a code violation to exhaust any of your, uh, your bath fans into your home or into your attic. Okay, last project is the water savers. So this is things like low flow shower heads, low flow toilets, um, faucet restrictors. All of those can save you, uh, they're, they're cheap, they can save you money. I mean, some of those like really big shower heads, you know, there are people are like, it's like it's raining in the jungle. And I'm like, I don't know why you have that. Just putting in a low flow shower head that costs five bucks from Menards, okay, and it's going to cut their water from going from, you know, four gallons per minute to a gallon and a half or less per minute. That's a huge, that's a huge water savings, especially if you take long showers. If you take, you know, 10, 15 minute showers, that's a ton of wasted water. And if you're in the city of Madison or, or any of the surrounding areas, if you've looked at your water bill, you'd probably be thinking, you, you'll be thinking once you, uh, once you actually look at it, because it's, it's ridiculous how much they, they charge us for water. Um, and that goes up every year too. So do yourself a favor, uh, get some water saving things. It's gonna make, it's gonna make things a lot nicer. Um, Plumbing repairs. 10% of water wasted to, is due to leaky plumbing and toilets. Repair those, you'll get significant savings. You know, if you've let that faucet drip for the last three years because you're like, oh, it's just a drip. Okay. That big, that little drip is gallons every year. So, you know, do something with it. Uh, standard flush toilets use up to three and a half gallons of water per flush. Consider a low flush toilet once time to replace or retrofit your current toilet with a uh, toilet water bag that you can put into the water tank. And that'll, that'll make it fill up, it'll fill the tank a little bit less. So it'll actually give you essentially like a low, a low flow toilet. So 
you can find those you can find those online or at, um, at Menards. Uh, dishwashers. Modern dishwasher is much more efficient with water and energy than washing dishes by hand. Uh, energy Star water heaters will heat your water more efficiently. You use less water and energy to reheat the water in the tank. Um, and, that, and that reminds me too, electric water heaters. If you can replace an electric water heater with a gas water heater whenever it comes time to replace that, that's going to give you a huge savings as well. So that's a little tip to write down. If you have an electrical water heater, hey, as soon as you can, get a natural gas water heater in there or propane, depending on what your, uh, your, your heating fuel is. Um, installing low flow faucet restrictors, turning off the water when you brush your, brush your teeth, that'll save you a lot of water. I know mom probably told you that when you're a kid. She was right. Uh, if you live in the city of Madison, there's a low flow toilet rebate. They'll give you up to $100 uh, rebate for a low flow toilet to be installed. And they, if you go onto the city of Madison website, citymadison.com slash water slash sustainability slash toilet dash rebate, uh, you can see all of the different toilets that are uh, applicable. All of the Kohler ones are, I mean, there's a list of like 300 toilets on there. Um, they're all, uh, you, can, you can get the rebate for all of those. I think most of them are probably in that like $150 range. So, you know, an extra hundred bucks to replace. So it costs $50 to replace a toilet. Um, that's gonna save you water. Why not? You know, it should pay for itself. Uh, windows and doors. So this is a uh, this is the one that gets tricky. Most homes I go into, the first thing that somebody says when I walk in the door and I say, "Tell me what the issues are." They say, "Windows and doors." Okay. Now, windows and doors are a crucial part of the exterior shell of the home. Absolutely, but they're very expensive. Talking thirty to eighty dollars, possibly more. Um, when I when I made these slides with about five years ago, it's probably gone up there. So $800, eight, 800 to $1,200 a window, a window just for one. That's how expensive the new windows are. Um, the material is yeah, not that expensive, like moderately expensive, but the, the amount of labor that has to get put into them, especially if they have to reframe or resash or reseal a window, if you have anything that's been rotting, uh, all of that's going to add up, and you're talking about uh, possibly a very, very expensive window replacements. So when people are like, oh, if I were just replace all my windows, my house would feel better. Don't believe that hype. Okay? That isn't necessarily the, the truth. There's simple repairs that you can do on windows. Um, new storm windows. You can do glass or glazing replacements. If you have like a broken window or the glazing on the window has started to deteriorate, okay, all of those things can get reglazed. And again, all of this stuff can be found on YouTube. YouTube is an awesome resource. Find literally everything uh, about any of these projects on YouTube. I use it all the time. Uh, I suggest you do as well. Uh, put people that put the plastic on the windows, yeah, they're not crazy. They're, they're actually doing a, a, a good thing. It makes, the, uh, it makes that feel a lot better. You won't get that draft through the window if you have older windows that might come through or with air that might come through. So whenever you hear someone say, you know, you can save up to 40, 50, 60% of energy costs by replacing all of your windows, they're just trying to sell you windows. Okay. So how do we get started? So most of these are weekend projects, don't cost a whole lot, but will create good energy savings. Uh, many of these resources can be found on various internet research or home improvement books or also going to um, you know, Home Depot and Lowe's. I guess I don't know what they're doing now with COVID-19, but you know, they have those classes uh, where they'll you know, show you how to do certain things, like how do I finish drywall? This is how you finish drywall. Um, or we also have, for Project Home, we have a whole bunch of different classes throughout the year. Um, one of the ones that we do is with our, uh, our plumber, Rich, uh, Big Rich. He, He'll show you how to do simple plumbing repairs. Um, you know, if he has to do a Zoom class this year, it'd be uh, not great, but uh, once we get back to in-person and you can actually see all of the things that he, he does, 
uh, it'll help you help you out a lot, uh, especially with the plumbing ones. So uh, remember to look at our website too, the Project Home WI.org, and we've got uh, we've got resources there, but we've also got our class list there as well. Uh, another great idea is get an energy audit done. You can go through the Focus on Energy Home Performance with Energy Star program. Uh, you can schedule an energy assessment with them. There's approved contractors who will create a custom report for your home. Uh, and they'll either be able to do the work through their company or they can uh, provide you with uh, different contractors that would be able to do the work. And uh, Focus on Energy will help reduce the cost of the assessment and work if and the work if you do the work through an approved trade ally or contractor. You know, some people are just interested in having the assessment done, see what's wrong, and then get their own contractor. Um, if you go through the Focus Energy program, they'll be able to give you the rebates uh, based on how much, how much savings uh, is potentially gonna be generated for your home by doing the work. So focusonenergy.com, a uh, great resource. It's a you know, Wisconsin thing, so um, check it out for sure. So performance testing, uh, if you decide that you want to have an energy assessment done, here's some things that would happen. This is what we call a blower door. This, will, uh, uh, this is a, a tool that we use, uh, energy assessors like myself, we use to see how leaky a building is. We'll also use that to see where there's air sealing issues within the home uh, by using this in conjunction with an infrared camera uh, to see if you've got leaky windows, leaky doors, uh, possibly other cold spots or even moisture issues in the home. Uh, so like I said, performance testing, you know, we test furnaces, we test water heaters. We use our infrared cameras to see how much energy is being used in the home, see if there's cold spots or hot spots in the home, um, and also doing a full inspection of attics and crawl spaces, uh, looking in, you know, into the, the walls, just trying to like find out exactly what's going on with the home. You know, um, a lot of people when they have a home inspection done, and this is this is just another example of of how good an energy assessment it can be in your home. There's I can't tell you how many times I've gone into a house that someone's just bought it. You know, within the last six six months, and they had a home inspection done. And I'm looking at their house and I'm finding all these issues and I'm finding all these issues. And why didn't my home inspector find this? I'm like, you know, a home inspector can only see so much. They kind of, they focus on certain areas. They're not looking at, they're not looking at the like details of the house. You know? I would say it's like a mountain. Okay? The home inspector is in the plane circling the mountain and they're getting the best idea there. The energy assessor is the one that's taking the backpack and climbing the whole mountain so they can see every little piece of the home. Um, energy assessment can uncover a lot of issues with your house, health and safety issues. Uh, hopefully not too many, and instead they're just be able to focus on how to save the energy and make the house more comfortable. A uh, few resources and incentives. So like I said, our website is a great one. It's uh, projecthomewi.org. Uh, we've got some resources on there. We've got our full class list throughout, our, throughout the year. Obviously right now our classes are all uh, online through the Zoom, uh, Zoom app right now. Focus on Energy, um, a great book if you like to, to read up. Uh, the Homeowner's Handbook to Energy Efficiency by John Krigger and Chris, Chris Dorsey. Uh, I, have, I have two copies of it right here. So uh, I, love, I love this book, uh, it's, it's a great book. It's helped me tremendously in my home and uh, I sometimes will loan it out to um, to people, uh, to homeowners that are, are uh, maybe struggling with some things. So um, buildingscience.com, if you want to get into like the nerdier part of things, um, that's, that's a place that you'll know, sometimes see me. And energystar.gov is another, uh, another good resource. So thank you very much for joining me. Um, it looks like I've got couple of questions, a couple of chat questions. Let me see if I can pull those up here. There we go. Well, I had it there for a second. Okay. 
So first question I have here from Joan is, does unplugging help? So yes, absolutely. Um, it, it depends on the type of appliance or uh, the cord that you have installed. The, uh, if, if it's like an old fridge and you're only using it for a certain part of the year, um, definitely unplug it, you know, when you can. Um, there, you sometimes hear about like the phantom loads, you know, with like cell phone chargers and things like that. Um, anything that has, then anything that's considered a trickle charge, we call it a trickle charge, so like cell phones um, or anything that would uh, charge a battery, those do have a phantom load. So those are ones that you do want to unplug, um, you know, when you're not using them. So uh, you can get things like smart strips, uh, you know, that only come on when something's actually being charged in them. You can get those those types of smart strips at uh, at a hardware store, um, but yes, unplugging is definitely uh, a good a good option because I mean, as long as it's unplugged, can't be can't suck up any energy. Um, so I guess at this point, if you have any questions, please uh, put them into the chat box, or if you want to unmute your mic and ask a more specific question, I'm here to answer those for for a little bit here yet. I had a question. I have a house that's over 100 years old, and I just um, ordered to get all my storm windows replaced. But the windows themselves, you know, are these beautiful old windows I want to have refurbished. Um, and I'm sure it'd be costly. And I don't even know where to begin to find somebody to do it. Because I'm handicapped, I can't really do any of this stuff. So yeah. is there a good contractor out there that does that kind of thing and make, you know, the windows really efficient again? Or well, I, there's a I, there's a couple of things with that. Um, so, one, if do you say you said these are original windows? Yep. Okay. So, I mean, an original window, single pane window, it's it's um, it's pretty much what you, what you've got. But I agree with you that you know the character of of original windows is amazing. Um, things that you could do to uh, make them more efficient or make sure that they're they're working the best that they they can be is making sure that the glazing around you know from between the where the wood and the the glass connect you know, that whole area needs to be uh, has to have glazing in it if the glazing is deteriorating you want to get that reglazed um, Really, any window company can do that. Uh, we've used City Glass out of Janesville is one that we've used, and um, City Glass does a, a good job with, you know, they'll they'll remove the window, they'll reglaze it, and then um, I would suggest is what to do is have a vinyl storm window on the outside of it for the winter. Have what? A vinyl a vinyl storm window. Yeah, that's what I'm getting now because my okay. old um, storm windows are at least probably 50, if not many years older than that even. Yeah, and they're probably wood or metal. Um, vinyl or fiberglass would be your best option for storm windows. Uh, you know, that would be the frame and obviously the storm window would be like a plexiglass or, or, or a plastic style glass. Um, so that's probably your best option. And like I said, City Glass out of Janesville is a good is a good option. They um, they've done a lot of work for us through the years, so you could try them. You could also try Martin Glass uh, if you're in the city of Madison. Uh, okay. They're right down in Atwood Avenue. It's Martin Glass, and uh, they uh, they've done a ton of work for us. Um, and they they do have people that go out and do that work, and they're really they're they're probably one of the more old school. Uh, glass companies in the area so that might be a, a good place to check and that was martin m-a-r-t-i-n correct okay all right thank you you're welcome i have a, a question from melissa it says any advice for very humid environment humid environments like near the water um well i've got a few ideas so I guess it depends on what you know what specifically you're looking for. If it's a um, 
humidity issue that's maybe causing rot in the exterior of your home, like maybe the uh, like wood siding. We see that sometimes. Um, there's not a lot you can do about that uh, except to go over the wood siding with like a vinyl siding. Uh, you can also get specific types of paints or stains so are kind of like a water block that will help to um, kind of mitigate the, the effects that uh, that water has on it. Um, if you're not, if you're, you know, like near one of the lakes here or, or one of the rivers, you're not, it's not a super humid environment, um, but if it's something where you're more like a tropical location, um, I'm not exactly the expert for that, but uh, otherwise the, the best option is to make sure that any deterioration gets taken care of right away. And especially with wood siding, uh, either getting it replaced and restained or get it um, uh, vinyl siding to go over the top of it. Hopefully that answered your question, Melissa. Does anyone have any other questions that you want to type in the chat box or uh, ask more specific question? Um, one more question about the storm windows. Am I not replacing ones that are in the porch at this time just because of the cost? But in the, the windows don't really work that well, but is that suggested to replace in the porch also? I mean, I, I would think that would help with the energy, but is it essential? <clears throat> is the porch open? Is it uh, like a heated porch or is it a, like a three seasons porch that has uh, airflow to it all year long? It doesn't have heating in it, but it's uh, it's enclosed, and it already has those old old storm windows in it now. Okay. So, you know. Yeah, I mean those those aren't. I mean we call that like that would be what I'd consider like an intermediary space. So yeah. like like a garage, uh, you know, to be an intermediary space or an attic. Uh, so because you don't have, you know, the the direct, you know, uh, ambient outside air against it it's less needed to replace that right away. But uh, down the road, I would say that um, probably would want to get that, get that done, you know, but get the, get the ones that are, are open to the outside that are exposed to the outside done first. Uh, and then when you can get to those, cause it, it will help um, some, but not as much as, as it would be with the accessories. All right. Okay. Thank you. Go on. All right, well, it looks like we're kind of wrapping up here. So um, I hope that this, uh, this presentation helped you with some of, some of the projects that maybe you're trying to tackle. Uh, if you do have any other questions about specific things, you can always reach out to us. Uh, Project Home is always a resource for everybody in the community. And uh, you can go onto our website uh, to get some of those resources there. Or you can also call directly to our front desk and our uh, um, thank you very much, Liz. Go there and you can also see if you may qualify for some of our, our other programs like the uh, low income weatherization program or uh, some of our other programs that help with uh, different home repair uh, items for, uh, for low to moderately income people. Uh, and then, like I said, if you want to call directly to our office and talk to somebody here. We're always, we're always available to, uh, to answer those questions as well.